Uh, good afternoon, and welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club Hong Kong. Uh, my name is Anthony Daparan. I'm a member of the professional committee here at the FCC, which uh, is the committee that organizes uh, events like these. And uh, thanks very much for, for joining us today. Uh, last week, uh, Apple announced the latest iPhone, the iPhone 15. And the, the most reported feature of the new iPhone wasn't its camera or its screen or its chip speed. Uh, but everyone was very excited about the change of the plug on the bottom of the iPhone from a, a lightning cable to the new USB-C cable. Um, and a few weeks prior to that, uh, Huawei announced their latest phone, the uh, Huawei Mate 60 Pro. Uh, and again, the most reported feature of that new phone wasn't its camera or its uh, screen or any of the other things it could do, but the fact that it featured a new chip designed and made in China. Um, and, and both of these recent developments reflect uh, aspects of the conflict between different regulators around the world um, that our speaker today calls the three digital empires regulating global technology. Uh, so we'd like to welcome Professor Arnu Bradford to uh, the FCC. Um, Professor Bradford is the Henry L. Moses Professor of Law and International Organizations at Columbia Law School. Uh, she is also a director for Columbia's European Legal Studies Center and a senior scholar at the Jerome A. Chazen Institute for Global Business at Columbia Business School. Uh, Anu is an expert on international trade law, European Union law, digital regulation, and comparative and international antitrust law. Uh, she earned her SJD and LLM degrees from Harvard Law School and also holds a law degree from the University of Helsinki. Uh, Anu is the author of The Brussels Effect, How the European Union Rules the World, which was named one of the best books of 2020 by Foreign Affairs. And her latest book, Digital Empires, The Global Battle to Regulate Technology, has just been published by Oxford University Press, and there are some copies at the back of the room which you can peruse later. Um, and that will be the subject of our conversation today. So uh, welcome, Anu, to the FCC. Thank you so much. Delighted to be here. Uh, let, let's begin by, uh, I guess, defining the problem. I know there was a very striking quote in your book. You wrote, the power vested in the big tech companies is so vast that it increasingly competes with the power exercised by nation states. Um, so I guess to begin with, why do tech companies need to be regulated and, and what about them needs to be regulated? Yeah, so I think there is a growing sense around the world that these tech companies are not only instrument towards greater societal progress and economic uh, growth, but they also are the source of many of the harms that we are experiencing. So the markets have become increasingly concentrated. It's in the hands of few individual firms that have the kind of economic power, political power, informational power, cultural power over our societies. And sometimes they use it not to further public interest, but to our detriment. So we are surrounded by rampant disinformation, hate speech in the online environment. That was the one that was supposed to be very enabling uh, a space for robust public conversations. We also constantly uh, confront the breaches of our fundamental right to privacy when our data is being exploited or then it is being uh, uh, sort of used uh, by governments towards surveillance. So there's a lot of concerns around those issues. Now artificial intelligence. So there's a tremendous excitement of what it can do to individuals and societies. And, uh, but at the same time, there's an increasing concern that it needs guardrails, that things can also go wrong. It can be a source and an amplifier of many of these harms. So I think the governments around the world are now coalescing behind the idea that big tech has become too powerful and it does need rules but there doesn't seem to be yet a consensus on what those rules ought to look like. Yeah, certainly. And I think there is also, along with sort of a growing political uh, consciousness of this, a sort of a public, pub, the world of public opinion is turning in that direction too. And I guess certain recent incidents, such as the you know, Cambridge Analytica Brexit vote scandal or the, the January 6th riot in the US, which is sort of fueled by online misinformation that's sort of a help, perhaps helping to push public opinion in that direction as well. Is that right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And even in places like the United States that has this very entrenched view on um, governing internet in the way that is rooted on free speech, the free internet, the incentives to innovate, the government should stay out of the way so that we can really hand the governance to the tech companies that have generated so much wealth 
in the United States. So, um, but even the Americans are now starting to sort of second guess these techno libertarian foundations uh, of its own digital society. So we, if you look at public opinion surveys, people want more tech regulation. Mm -hmm. If you look at the lawmakers in uh, the US Congress, they don't really agree on anything in the US. They agree on two things. One is that China is a problem. The second thing they agree on is that the big tech is a problem. So both Republicans and Democrats are also now putting forward various bills, whether it's federal privacy law, whether it's antitrust, whether now let's regulate AI. We can talk about why that has not thus far translated into actual legislation, but the conversation today around technology is very different in the US. Certainly, thank you. So that's sort of the big picture to background to, to what I guess what is being regulated. So let's now turn to who's doing the regulating. And your book titled Digital Empires refers to three digital empires that you suggest are, are the ones that are really responsible for regulating the global technology industry. Um, those three empires being the US, China, and the EU. So could you perhaps just give an overview of this concept of what of these, these three digital empires and, and the ways that they, they approach regulation? Yeah, great. So here's already the first argument of the book, which is that this public conversation often portrays that we live in this bipolar digital world. We have the choosing between Chinese internet and American internet or looking at this superpower rivalry among the two uh, leading tech uh, uh, economies. Um, so I uh, dispute this idea that the rest of the world would be at the mercy of these two uh, technological superpowers and forced to choose between them. So I bring the European Union to the picture and I can explain why that is. But let me just like walk through the three models. So the book basically says that there are three different ways to think about digital governance, in, in, uh, broadly speaking. There's an American market-driven model, there is a Chinese state-driven model, and then there's a European, what I call a rights-driven model. So the American market-driven model is premised on this idea of free internet, a free speech, incentives to innovate, the government should really back off, uh, and uh, so it essentially hands the regulation over to the tech company. So it's a techno-libertarian, techno-optimist vision uh, of the digital world. The Chinese state-driven model has different sort of set of values that it's incorporated into its regulatory model. So China wants to, or Chinese government wants to make China a technological superpower, and it's willing to leverage a lot of state resources towards that goal. But China is also keen to use technology to further the political goals of the Chinese Communist Party. So technology is an instrument and tool for surveillance and censorship and propaganda in the name of then uh, providing social stability and furthering the political control of the Communist Party. So the Europeans are not only uncomfortable with the state-driven model, which they find too oppressive, they are also uncomfortable with the market-driven model, which they find too permissive. That's why the Europeans have put forward their own third way, which is called a rights-driven model. And that is really a, a vision of a human-centric digital transformation that um, focuses on protecting the fundamental rights of individuals, the users, the citizens, the consumers, but also then the democratic structures of the society and uh, also create a fairness in a digital society. It's a little bit like if you think about the social market economy model of Europe, that translated in the digital space. So we need to redistribute power away from the tech companies to smaller players, not just tech giants, to users uh, and uh, to sort of citizens, the public at large. So that's the, the European rights-driven model. But let me now and then maybe mention why I call these three then empires, mm. because I think that's a, it's a big, big title, and let me defend the, the, the choice of the word empire, which can be provocative. So the reason I call them empires is, is that none of the three regulatory models are confined to the borders of these jurisdictions. Instead, they are all exporting their regulatory models across the global marketplace. But they are exporting them through different means. So this regulatory race, this competition uh, for influence over the, the digital society takes place through the Americans exporting the private power of their companies. So it's the US tech giants that are really taking over the world. You have 
if you consider even like, for instance, Meta's Facebook, they have 3 billion users in 160 countries that are then also exporting through us using their products and services. These are uh, 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 the American values that are embedded in the ethos of these companies. China, on the other hand, is primarily exporting the infrastructure power. So it's building digital infrastructures, 5G networks, data centers, surveillance cities. So if you think about smart cities, safe cities, undersea cables. And this, through this digital Silk Road, it's also then exporting the, the Chinese influence across Africa, parts of Asia, Latin America, even Europe. So now this is already then, if I think about the second <coughs> argument of the book, that we, we often think about the world sort of developing into this kind of split internet. We have Chinese internet and American internet, and these kind of spheres would be very separate from one another. But actually the empire's influence is often overlapping in different markets because they all contribute a different layer to the digital economy system around the, the world. So often we have markets that have American tech companies, Chinese digital infrastructure, and European digital regulations. So what is the European export? It's really, it's not this infrastructure, it's not the private power of its companies, but it is its digital regulations. So Europe often is at the forefront with regulations like the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, with very uh, vigorous uh, regulation of antitrust, so competition. Uh, hate speech, disinformation, right now the AI Act that is expected to be finalized by the end of the year. And then through this phenomenon that I have described, the Brussels effect, which is the, my earlier book title, the multinationals, the many tech companies of the world are obeying the European rules as the price for doing business in Europe, but often extending those rules across their global conduct and their global production because they want to avoid the cost of complying with multiple different regulatory regimes. H hence the USB-C plug on the new iPhone. Exactly. <laughs> so to what extent is each of these three empires sort of exporting of their regulatory power something that they're doing consciously? To what extent is it digital colonialism, if you will? Yeah, so I think um, it's uh, the, the notion of empire can have both very negative connotations. So we can talk about American free trade imperialism or Chinese surveillance imperialism, the European regulatory imperialism. But I think it's a little bit more nuanced picture. So these empires are sometimes very much welcome. Mm. So they're almost like historically, we if you look at the scholarship of empires, they talk about empires by invitation. Yeah. So sometimes actually there are countries around the world. This is not just a master plan of Beijing to basically build the entire uh, digital networks of the world. Yes, part of that is conscious, part of that is proactive, but it's also governments go into Chinese companies and say, look, we need a path to digital development. You have the companies that can provide it cheaply with assistance often from Beijing in terms of financing, and it is pretty good. So there's also kind of a demand of these infrastructures. And then there are many markets around the world where the consumers have become dependent and really embrace the American tech giants' products and services. So few of us would not know what to do if we could not Google, if we did not have those Google Maps, if we did not have access to those devices that define our daily existence. And the same thing with the Europeans. There are many who say, look, this is the Europeans now imposing their rules to the rest of the world. There are privacy advocates in the US that are grateful, immensely grateful, that at least somebody is looking after our privacy. And through European efforts, we are getting some of the positive externalities, some of the benefits. Or then there are developing country governments who say, well, we have no business of policing these tech giants. So thank you for, for preventing that merger so that we also get the benefits in our markets. So it's sometimes a little bit more complicated, whether it is a conscious strategy which partially it is, mm. but at the same time, there are many markets where you sort of welcome the presence of the empires. But now there's a little bit of like, yes, maybe I initially welcome, but now they become a little too powerful. So maybe now I welcome the European empire and have the European digital empire help me push back yeah. on the excess of the American digital empire. Yeah, um, and there's a couple of sort of, I guess, uh, counterintuitive either criticisms or, or benefits of the couple of the models that I think it's worth talking about. I mean, firstly, in relation to the China model, you mentioned that you know, China is often very welcome in terms of the, the material support through their digital Silk Road, their building of infrastructure and those sorts of things. Um, but also from, a, I guess, a, an ideological point of view, in, in many places in the world, many governments 
uh, see the China model as something that that is that is sort of more aligned with their values or the way they want to run their countries. And indeed, even in the West, when you know the the extremes of social media and misinformation influence even our, our democratic system, we wonder whether some tighter controls along the style of Chinese controls of social media might not be something that's more attractive. So perhaps just speak a bit about how China, even though I guess from the West we're used to seeing it as 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 you know. A, a bad system may, in fact, offer benefits certainly to, to some parts of the world. Yeah. So I talk about in the book how uh, the U.S. and the EU at times struggle to kind of confront the Chinese model and persuade the rest of the world that they, for instance, should not be using Huawei. There are many countries that are comfortable using Huawei despite the U.S.'s efforts to tell them otherwise. I, I use an anecdote in the book where the U.S. government is trying to persuade the Malaysian government to reject Huawei and basic, basically warned that, well, you are going to be subject to surveillance by Beijing if you do that. And the prime minister responds, what is there to spy on in Malaysia? So everybody just does not share the concerns that American and Europeans do. The same thing when Europeans say that, look, these surveillance cities, smart cities, safe cities, whatever you call them, you basically allow mass surveillance of your citizens. And then there are many citizens who said, I, my concern is that I will get killed on these streets. There's a lot of crime, and I'm fine with some su uh, surveillance. Privacy is not in the hierarchy of concerns. That's the Europeans. You can afford to worry about that. So sometimes I think there is a, the world doesn't fully share the, the liberal democratic values and that vision that the Europeans are offering through, through their model in many, many parts of the world. So there are a couple of, I think that's one reason. One thing that I kind of, uh, it's an argument that I had a hard time making in the book, but I think one needs to, in the name of fairness, <laughs> concede that, especially in America, um, there's been this notion that American model is partially superior because people are free. Mm -hmm. And when you are free, freedom is necessary for innovation. So then you see more innovation when you have freedom. And China has challenged that notion. China has shown that even though it is not free, it has been able to innovate. And that, I think, has been a hard, make it then harder for, for instance, the U.S. to present the countries with this very stark choice, saying, like, you choose economic progress and innovation, or you choose political control. Many of them look at China and say, look, I can have both. I want to make a little caveat because I think it's an important point here, is that if you think about, for instance, China's achievements in artificial intelligence. So China is leading in many dimensions of AI development, including the development of surveillance technologies, facial recognition. But China is now trailing the U.S. when it comes to generative AI. And this may be the test case that ultimately the, the need to make the, the, the large language models that are used to then, like uh, the, the, the train, data that is used to train this generative AI consistent with the censorship regime, reduces the amount of data that you can use to train those models, which is partially going to be, and at least now has turned out to be a limitation in China's ability to do that. So that might be the moment for the U.S. to say that, look, ultimately there are limits to your innovation in certain domains of technology where, uh, where ultimately if you are restricting inf information, you are having a, a genuine trade-off. So y you mentioned AI. What are the, the approaches to regulating AI in, I guess, in all three of the empires, but in particular the EU and, and the U.S. as, as well as China? So it, it maps really well, I would think, with this market-driven, state-driven, and the rights-driven. So if you look at, even though the conversation has shifted in the U.S. and there's recognition that we may need to regulate AI, what we are seeing is the tech companies go into Congress, now behind closed doors this past week, teaching the lawmakers about uh, uh, AI and basically sending their message, which ultimately is a very innovation-friendly, you need our technologies, and, and, and that's why you don't want to come down with too harsh regulatory measures. So we've seen this like blueprints, voluntary guidelines, which ultimately leave the tech companies in charge, exactly like my, my, uh, you know, the market-driven model would suggest or predict to, to happen. China has been actually quite proactive and have come quite hard on the, on the tech companies, and that's exactly because of the concern that I just mentioned on generative AI. So the idea that they can actually be a possibility that those AI tools compromise the political goals around censorship, which means that China needs to restrict 
the kind of data that can be used so that those ch ch GPTs of the world are equal and don't take the life of their own and, and basically generate the kind of outcomes and information that would not be in line with the, the message of the, the Communist Party. So China is, is, is regulating them quite heavily, but at the same time still concerned with the China's technological supremacy, so also trying to balance innovation. Europeans are really proactive. They have been for the last two years working on this comprehensive AI Act, which will become law by the end of uh, this year, I would predict. And that is a very kind of rights-driven uh, uh, um, regulatory model that is trying to, yes, preserve the ability to innovate and allow the kind of harmless AI to be offered in the marketplace, but it has this kind of risk approach, meaning that the riskier the AI, the more guard raised we are posing. And interestingly, um, the, it prohibits altogether certain type of AI applications. And if you look at the list of prohibited applications, they are exactly taken from how Beijing is using AI. So social scoring is prohibited. Uh, uh, Real-time facial recognition in public places is prohibited. So those are predictive policing. Those are the kind of domains. But then there's a bunch of uh, sort of AI applications which are not prohibited but are heavily regulated. So for instance, when we worry about bias in the banks use AI to determine who gets access to credit or when the state uh, um, uh, sort of hands out public benefits but uses AI or then when firms recruit uh, um, um, personnel and there could be bias if uh, the, uh, the AIs uh, would amplify that one and not be sort of trained on neutral data sets. So in that sense, we see the same like instincts that are now guiding these, these different empires towards different directions when it comes to AI. Mm. The, the EU approach to AI regulation, I think, is um, uh, illustrates or gives an opportunity to raise a, a common objection to the EU approach to regulation, which is that it, it stifles innovation, that there's so many of these you know, EU regulations and requirements that companies aren't able to innovate and develop the technology, and that's, some people argue, why we don't see a lot of big tech companies coming out of Europe. But you, you have some um, issues with that argument. Could you perhaps speak to that? Yeah, so I am a huge proponent of innovation. Who would not? I think the Europeans certainly cannot afford to forego the, uh, the any sources that AI or other technologies offer for economic growth. But I think it is a really sort of an inaccurate or simplistic way to draw this connection between more digital regulation automatically leads to less innovation. So yes, Europe regulates. Yes, we don't see the leading tech uh, companies emanating from Europe, but I think it has very little to do with digital regulation. So let me offer like four other reasons that I think are much more important determinants why the Europeans are not matching up to the, the, the American technological powers. So first, we don't have a digital integrated single market in Europe. It still consists of fragmented member states, different languages, different sort of cultural attributes and different laws. It's very hard for a tech company to scale in the EU. Again, not the GDPR story. It's just the way the markets work. Second, capital markets. There is no similarly robust, integrated, strong capital markets in the EU, what we have in the United States. So it is harder to fund those innovations in the EU. Third, the differences between the US and the EU towards failure bankruptcy laws, very punitive in the EU, makes it really hard for you to raise money again if you have failed. So failure is often fatal in the EU. It's a rite of passage in Silicon Valley. Then we see whether we can throw more money at you because you clearly are you know, trying hard and you are ambitious. And the fourth, and this is really important in my view, which is immigration. So Americans have been extremely successful in tapping into the global talent that really fuels the innovation ecosystem in the, in the U.S. So over 50% of over $1 billion startups in the U.S. have an immigr immigrant founder. If we even just look at the leading tech companies and the founders of those companies, you see a very powerful story of immigration. So Steve Jobs of Apple is a son of a Syrian immigrant. Jeff Bezos of Amazon is a second-generation Cuban immigrant. Elon Musk of Tesla is South African. The co-founder of uh, Facebook, Eduardo Savarin, is Brazilian. The co-founder of Google, Sergey Brin, is Russian. 
I could go on. This is, I think, what explains why the U.S. is doing so well, not the reason that they have refrained from passing on some of these monumental digital regulations. And I suppose not to mention that, that many of the innovative companies are you know, from the U.S. but operating under EU rules when they're in Europe. So Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there's one very large country or very large player um, which perhaps doesn't fit comfortably into any of these, um, and that's India. Mm -hmm. um, huge comp country, a uh, uh, very big player in certain sectors of tech. Where, where does India fit into these, these, this landscape of the three empires? It doesn't seem to sort of sit comfortably in any of the camps. So I think what's really interesting is that this is not the same way we think about as the Cold War that you were in the communist country or you were in the capitalist camp. And uh, sort of the, the, the lines are more blurred. And there are many countries that will probably identify themselves as non-aligned countries that are borrowing elements from each. So I just came from Singapore before coming here. They have many state-driven features in the way they govern tech companies. It is not exactly free speech online. But at the same time, they also have a lot of market-driven elements because it's a small, very sort of export-oriented economy. They don't like a lot of rules. Japan is a good example, for instance, having also like a very European sensibilities in terms of regulation. A lot of the sort of human-centric digital transformation language is incorporated there. They follow the privacy law of the EU very closely. But then often they also use voluntary guidance to further those very similar objectives that the Europeans do. But India, your main question. I think that's a good example of a uh, country that is large enough. I don't consider a fourth digital empire. There's not a separate Indian model that I see being exported uh, uh, across the world. But India is certainly a, an important player, and it's an important battleground. And, and also a um, country that the US and the EU would like to count to be one of the techno-democracies to sort of confront China jointly, but they are a little bit uneasy because India's commitment to democracy and fundamental rights under Modi has been a little bit patchy, as right? As we've learned in the last few days from Canada. Yeah. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So that's sometimes hard to reconcile fully that, look, where do you draw the line? How Puritan are you when you say that, look, we share the values? Mm. Does India s share those values? India has been also coming very uh, hard down on Chinese apps, banning a lot of the Chinese apps. So in many ways, there is, a, for instance, privacy law in India that is a really closely copying the GDPR. So really adopts many of the rights-driven characteristics, but then has really strong data localization requirements, which is kind of a, a borrowing from the Chinese state-driven model. So even though there are certain markets that are, I think, more squarely fall within a certain um, sort of sphere of uh, 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 influence of a certain digital empire. Then there are, I think, India is the prime example where we do see the kind of playing more strategically what is in the interest of the country. So we, we have our, our three digital empires, um, and then uh, they inevitably come into conflict with one another, and, and, and private sector entities come into conflict with them. So looking at the first, what you refer to as the, the horizontal battles between the, the three empires, can you talk a bit about how that works? Yeah, so I, I talk about two level battles that we are observing. So one is this horizontal battle between the three empires. So the US-China tech war is a major horizontal battle between the two technological superpowers. But then there are extensive regulatory battles between the US and the EU, whereby the EU thinks that the US companies are overreaching. They are taking too, lit are taking too much and giving too little in the EU. And then they are trying to rein in these companies, which then leads the U.S. to say that, well, your regulators are overreaching. And you are just, this is part of this envy-driven European attempt to level the playing field because you cannot generate those technologies. So we see a lot of regulatory battles in antitrust, in data privacy versus surveillance. Can data flow from Europe to the U.S. Uh, while sort of being uh, sensitive to European privacy concerns and digital taxation, for instance, the European countries' attempts to tax uh, the U.S. tech giants. So those are some of the major horizontal battles. But I think at the same time, we have these empires battling one another for influence. They are also trying to battle the tech companies. That's the vertical battle. So in their own markets, they are trying to discipline then the tech companies. And, uh, and the EU has been doing that with, with gusto for a while. China has uh, first decided not to fight that battle. Then all of a sudden, when the state-driven model kicks in and there's a decision to start reigning in these tech companies, the crackdown was fierce and very effective. 
it's much harder to do that when you are committed to the sort of the democratic hurdles that are part of the, the legislative and enforcement infrastructure in the EU and the US. But the vertical battles then, they are very hard to fight. So I talk a lot about why because these tech companies are so immensely powerful, enforcing these laws is very, very difficult. Let me share just one statistic uh, with you. So when the EU uh, enacted the GDPR, the main enforcement agency in charge of implementing this was the Irish Data Protection Agency because the most of the US tech companies are headquartered there. So the annual budget of the Irish Data Protection Agency the year it was first enforced in GDPR was nine million. It is what the US tech companies headquartered in Dublin make every 10 minutes. <laughs> it's very hard to fight this and they can afford to have the scadence of the world uh, <laughs> to um, to uh, defend them. They have enormous resources and the governments don't. Mm. And it's also very hard to, for instance, moderate content online. So every minute there's 500 hours of YouTube video being loaded. There's 150,000 messages in, in Facebook. Nobody in Brussels is going to be screening this. China is doing content moderation, but in a very uniquely effectively, not perfectly, also partially by design, not perfectly. But that is very hard to replicate, even for any sort of aspiring regulator who really wants to uh, uh, emulate the, the Chinese model. So the vertical battles are also very challenging. Mm. That doesn't mean that I'm sort of conceding to this kind of a techno-determinist future and say that the regulators cannot regulate technology, but I'm, I'm acknowledging the difficulties and also urging that we may need new instruments and tools to fight that battle. To what extent are some of those vertical battles actually proxy horizontal battles, if you were? Uh, uh, to what extent are states using private sector entities to, to fight their battle for them in some situation? Yeah, so these battles are definitely interlinked. Uh, so if you think about, for instance, that the states need to exercise more restraint when they go after their tech companies, mm -hmm. because these companies are not just the targets of regulation, but tools in fighting the, the horizontal battle. So China needs to think about that it cannot beat the US in its horizontal battle over technological su uh, superiority if it squashes all its tech companies. The same way that the US has been, for instance, adopting an uh, export licensing uh, 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 sort of regime vis-a-vis -vis China, and it continues to grant some of those licenses because it cannot afford fully then kill the economic opportunities for its own tech companies because it relies on those tech companies to generate the innovations that keeps the U.S. ahead in the tech race. So in that sense, it's a very much of a balancing act for all these, all these uh, um, regulators that they need the tech companies, but they need to kind of place guardrails, but not be kind of not overdo it. Mm. Uh, and you argue that the sort of the restraint that the competing battles uh, create leads to sort of, uh, or rather avoids the sort of binary outcomes that we often read, read about in the media. Is yeah. That right? yeah, so I think that the conversation is very binary. I started by this idea that it's like, it's US winning or China winning. I don't think US is winning and I don't think China is winning. I think they both are gaining some relative vi victories in some domains of tech competition. The same way that we are not going to see a full decoupling of whether it's semiconductors or other domains of, of, of technology. Nor are we seeing this kind of harmonious corporation-based globalization. We are seeing both pressures towards escalation and then more kind of pragmatic commercial considerations that push countries towards de-escalation. We have not seen full decoupling of the stock market. The Chinese government is hesitant with the listings to the US, but still has not completely wanted to close off the access of Chinese tech companies to uh, foreign capital. So we do see more kind of, a, we are between, I would say, rivalry and restraint. Mm. And there's a, there's a nice book by Mark Leonard called The Age of Unpeace. And I think that's kind of where we are. We don't have a full peace, but I think we don't have a full out war, but we are in this uncomfortable, yet somehow costly, but manageable mm. era of unpeace. And in the AI space, have we seen that sort of play out in sort of any horizontal or vertical battles yet, or are we still a little early to see AI getting involved there? It's probably early, but I think the governments are treating it with such urgency mm -hmm. that it's really kind of defining and sharpening their strategies because there's a recognition that AI is one of the most important theaters of war, if you like mm -hmm. to use the analogy. That's where the most important battles are being fought, and that's where you cannot afford uh, to be left behind. So if you look at, in AI, um, how much all players are investing, for instance, state subsidies. Mm -hmm 
to try to ramp up the AI industries. Here too, the US is playing Beijing's game. The US is no longer very market driven, committed to free markets, massive subsidies. And then we see, in addition to we see export controls, investment restrictions, both inbound and outbound. But we, we certainly see that AI is one of the main focuses here. But at the same time, I think it is also a focus, like really much sort of uh, redefining our debates in the vertical battle, because even the tech companies have now kind of warned us that this can go horribly wrong. And they're, they're kind of most pessimistic scenarios about AI, we make references to pandemics and nuclear war, that this is really something that, especially because of the accessibility of, of AI. So with the generative AI, it can be a tremendous promise for greater equality, because people around the world could access these tools. But also the bad actors can access these tools. So the idea that I'm not making the comparison to nuclear war is very hard to build nuclear weapons and for random actors to get access to them. But random actors can get access to powerful AI tools. And that's, I think, makes the case for regulation so compelling that the governments are really going to pains of trying to sort of straddle these tremendous opportunities, especially because those opportunities are not just economic, but also in terms of geopolitical, military capabilities of these technologies. So they cannot afford not to lead that race. But they also cannot afford sort of not to be conscious and hearing those warnings that if something goes wrong, something can go ultimately catastrophically wrong. Uh, so in about five minutes, we'll have time for questions from all of you. So prepare your questions or think about what you're going to ask. But before we get there, um, perhaps the, the most important question of the day, what, what of the future? Which of these three empires do you think are going to prevail and, and what, what are the prospects for, yeah. for the future here? So I make a couple of predictions on what happens in the, the, in the horizontal battle. Let me start from that first. So my first prediction is that the American digital empire is declining that there's very little faith anymore in the tech company self-regulation. Even the US is slowly abandoning its kind of a hardcore commitment to free markets and sort of recognizing that it hasn't provided a society that is necessarily free or where democracy is more robust. So if the US market-driven model is failing, what does it mean then for the rest of the world? So the democratic world is now increasingly coalescing behind a variant of the European rights-driven model. So you have the Australians, the Canadians, South Korea, uh, uh, um, uh, potentially partially Japan, and, and, and generally the UK, for instance. Brexit hasn't meant that the UK has really used its kind of market-driven instincts to go all, all out the American way. We just had the new online safety bill, for instance, accept, uh, adopted in the UK. So much of the world is now rather moving away from the market-driven model and gravitating towards the European model. But in the more authoritarian world and in parts of the developing world, for the reasons we discussed earlier, it's the Chinese model that holds greater appeal. So we also see the Chinese model do really well, which is then creating this setup whereby we are moving towards more bipolar world. But it's not this bipolar world where the world is choosing between US and China. It's more like the world consisting of techno-democracies trying to provide a kind of united front in a battle against China and other techno-autocracies. So it is a battle that is economic, it's technological, it's, it's ideological, geopolitical, which makes it a very high-stake battle. And especially this framing around techno-democracies and techno-autocracies, it may or may not be helpful. It may be helpful in rallying the coalition, for instance, helping the US and the EU overcome their differences and say like, come on, at a fundamental level, our differences are something that we can overcome because ultimately we are commit committed to liberal democracy. But it may not be, it may be alienating for many other, other countries which we are trying to attract to your, your uh, space. So there are some reasons why it's hard to beat the, the uh, authoritarian uh, model, but I think the biggest really concern for the Europeans and Americans in this battle is that they do care about the future of liberal democracy as a foundation of our digital society. And they should keep in mind that that goal can be lost in one of two ways. Either if they lose the horizontal battle to China and the world is turning more and more authoritarian. Mm. Second, also if they lose the vertical battle to tech companies. <coughs> The U.S. has a hard time legislating. We've talked a lot about how they, they, uh, attitudes are shifting, but we don't see those laws coming out of Congress. It's extremely dysfunctional. The EU can legislate. It has a hard time enforcing. 
China doesn't have a hard time legislating. China doesn't have a hard time enforcing when it really puts its mind to it. So that, I think, leaves the, the US and the EU with very big challenge that if they cannot show to themselves and to the world that there is a liberal, democratic way to govern tech companies, the true digital empires are either the authoritarians or the tech companies. And that is a very disconcerting outcome for anybody who believes in liberal democracy as a foundation for human engagement and for our digital society. Thank you. Um, so we have time for questions now. If any of you wish to ask a question, raise your hand and a microphone will be passed to you. And please give your name and affiliation uh, before you ask your question. Thank you. Um, Jessica Park, no affiliation, retired. Um, um, thank you very much for that. I, I just was wondering how on earth you became so intelligent. But it's okay, you don't have to answer that question. And, and I was just wondering what the world's going to be like for my grandchildren, my children, what's it going to be like in, in uh, 2040. I think that was just partly answered. Um, and the other thing, do you have any tips on, on how I can be less influenced by YouTube? And how I can be less manipulated by YouTube? <laughs> and it's, it's a silly question, but I feel as though I'm miserably controlled by some of the social media stuff. I, I, I have to put my hand up and say gleefully, I'm not on Facebook. <laughs> I'm not one of those three million people. Thank you. So one thing, I, I think you should be cheering for the Europeans. The, the Brussels effect is there for you, and it's supposed to look after your interests as well. But I'm British. Yeah, uh, <laughs> no, but the Brussels effect is extending the European regulations outside of the European Union. That's the empire concept that actually comes to your rescue. And so now I think what you would want to focus on is that what the EU now did with its landmark Digital Services Act, which has entered into force and now the tech companies are trying to figure out how to comply with that. So one thing that it, for instance, ban is targeted advertising on minors. So you mentioned you worry about the next generation. These minors are constantly being exploited by they, they targeted advertising. So the EU now bans it all together. And that's gonna be harder for, for instance, Instagram, for uh, Meta to say that, well, we no longer exploit the European youth, but we con continue to exploit the American youth, be quite comfortable doing that, because the expectations change, the expectations of users and the regulators. The same way that they can't then now use um, sort of protected categories, um, sort of race, religion, political affiliation, when they decide what kind of feed you are seeing. So TikTok now needs to provide a chronological feed as opposed to something that is driven by their own algorithm. So it's trying to sort of take a power away from these tech companies to design as addictive products, which is really designed to maximize their revenue-making goals. So you don't yet see quite the effects of the EU law. You should see them in a couple of years, and I hope that it will be effective. And that's, I think, one major test case, whether the liberal democratic governance model is actually going to take hold and, and really strike to the heart of the business model of these companies. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? You have identified three digital empires. Uh, is this on? Yes. Oh, yes, that's better. Uh, is that room for a third, which is in fact Russia? Apart from um, Vladimir Putin's excesses in Ukraine, where massive numbers of very clever, e wise people left Russia, uh, but will probably go back, is there not room for a big development in Russia for the same? disciplines? Um, so thank you. Let me make a couple of comments on Russia. So there's now, if you think about the Russian invasion of Ukraine, there's some real deep concern that I have first of these tech companies being the digital empires. If you read from Elon Musk's, uh, uh, Elon Musk's biography, um, he was in the position to prevent Ukrainians from launching a drone attack as part of the war because he con controls the Starlink. So it's basically his call whether he provides the network where this warfare can operate. And that is the decision that should not vest with an individual, any individual, let alone somebody like Elon Musk. <laughs> but then let's go back to sort of the, the Russia more broadly. What is quite challenging about Russia is that Russia is, I would say, like an aspiring authoritarian in the digital space. 
that it wants to move towards the Chinese state-driven model, and it's going to pains to tighten the censorship regime. It's just not as good at it as China is. It doesn't have the resources, both human resources, but also the technological capabilities that China has deployed in order to have a rather effective censorship regime. So, and the problem is that Russia did not build its digital infrastructure to be consistent with, with state-driven model to start. It started with a very free internet, and it's harder to take it away from people when you've first given it to them. The second, technologically, it's harder to impose those firewalls exposed. So there were uh, these uh, recent instances. Um, so it was actually w the moment when it uh, uh, sifted in uh, Russia was that when it was Putin's re-election. And that's when Putin noticed that it was the social media that started to be used against him. And he realized, look, this is not good. And I need to do something about it. And that's when Russia started exploring, moving towards uh, what China is doing. But in, in, in some of the clumsy attempts to do so, for instance, to try to slow down the traffic on Telegram and prevent Twitter from operating, they accidentally took down a bunch of government sites, including their own website of the, the authority in charge of this. So they are not doing it as well, but they are getting better. They are being trained partially by China. Um, but I think it just shows how it is harder for Russia to replicate what it wants to do, and there's still a gap between the capabilities of designing a certain model when you are making a shift from a free to an unfree internet. And we probably have time for one more question. Oh, well, probably two more. Okay, Lee and, and Tony. Uh, Tony Watson, Far East Investment Management. Um, uh, there was news on the wires yesterday that uh, Elon Musk was thinking of putting X, formerly known as Twitter, behind a paywall. Um, to what extent is this, can this be viewed as a form of self-regulation, i.e. it'll kick a lot of the bots and um, fake accounts off the system that obviously don't want to pay six to eight US dollars to, to stay active. So I don't think it's necessarily that the tech giants are always doing the wrong thing. They've sometimes taken many self-regulatory measures that even help the regulators achieve some of the goals. So there's a lot how Twitter is managed that the regulators would like to be done differently. But for instance, if I come back to the specific Twitter example in a minute, but what Apple did with its pro-privacy policies, when it basically gave users the option to easily choose that I do not want to be tracked. And when the users were given the option, they took it, which was much more devastating for Facebook than what GDPR has ever done. So sometimes it's when you actually see a horizontal battle where the tech giants uh, combat other tech giants, where you can see sort of an easing of the pressures to do it in the vertical level because they do the right thing. And um, so, so yes, in many ways, I think the Europeans, for instance, wouldn't be upset if some of those bots disappear. So that might actually be a very, very good one. But if you generally that start introducing paywalls and some pay for it and some don't, there's this whole broader question to that. Should you, for instance, the regulators say that we don't want you to exploit the data and data is kind of your, your business model is the invasion of our privacy. So why don't you provide an alternative that I can pay to use Twitter or Facebook, or then I give my data. But that's not really consistent with the European way of thinking that those who can afford to protect their privacy will afford. Mm. To, and the others are left to basically let their data be vulnerable. So I think there's many of these questions that yes, the self-regulation, sometimes it may be pointing to the right direction, but ultimately none of the regulators can think that there's ever a day when Elon Musk wakes up in the morning or even you know, Apple or the other guys and think, how can I advance public interest today? <laughs> how do I protect democracy? How do I uh, protect the data of individuals on my platform? They are still driven by their commercial considerations. They're not always doing the wrong thing. But ultimately we need to have the governments that are vested with the task of looking beyond the bottom line of this company. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Lee Williamson, the president of the club. I may be going to regret bringing this up as the topic if it is indeed the final question, but um, we, this has been a really interesting, uh, comprehensive talk. We've covered a lot about tech regulation, internet regulation, but one thing that we haven't covered, which makes up a lot of content on the internet, is pornography. 
um, the, uh, the numbers vary and compete as to how much of internet searches and internet traffic is made up through pornography, but I think it's fair to say it is a significant, uh, statistically significant number. I hear, uh, you know, there's reports that the EU is going to be doing, going further in, in regulating this very, very important topic, particularly with regards to underage access. Uh, as the father of a seven-year-old, this is something that is uh, of interest to me, and, and obviously it's a, a very, very important era, uh, area of internet regulation. Uh, wh what can you share there as to what that's going to look like in, in five to ten years? So I think that's one of those issues that is probably slightly less controversial than many others. So I think especially when we talk about pornography and underage children, that's one of the very few issues where the American lawmakers have managed to make some uh, some sort of exceptions to the Section 230. Section 230 is the liability shield in the U.S. that basically gives a free pass to the YouTubes of the world, whether they take down some content or decide to uh, not to do so. So they basically are just a tool, and we think about the users who post the content to be uh, responsible. But I think the one carve-out to that absolute sort of liability shield, the free internet shield, was when it comes to sort of sex trafficking. So there are elements of, so it's not exactly the same question, but I think that's where we have a precedent, that the lawmakers can think that this is not what our law should be furthering. And there are very few lawmakers who think that there's any justification to child pornography. So the Americans are very worried about censorship of any kind. So the idea that if we start drawing the lines, it becomes blurry at some point, and then we kind of lose more than we gain from having the government in, in the business. But I can imagine that it's one of those that it's known to be rampant, it's known to be extremely harmful, it's so prevalent that we, that we can actually get, it's, it's politically very easy to dial up the regulation. The question is though that do you want that to be done by sort of a, the tech companies develop tools that automatically do the filtering and how much is it sort of designed by governments on how that filtering actually then works. But I think as a goal, it's something that I am not at all surprised that the momentum is there and it's not limited to the EU. The UK has also been pretty strict on this one. Thank you. Uh, so we've reached the end of our time together today. Um, there are copies of Digital Empires at the back of the room there. Um, if you uh, have a, a special interest or perhaps are a journalist wishing to review a copy, you're, you're welcome to take a complimentary copy. There are a limited number there. Otherwise, there is a flyer with a code for a, an author's discount. Is that right? So you can purchase a discounted copy using the code on, on the flyers. Um, but with that, thank you, Anu, for joining us today for a fascinating talk. We have a small uh, token of our appreciation thank from you. the FCC. And thank thanks you. for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank Anthony. You everyone. And thank you, everyone. Really enjoyed the questions, the conversation. So thank you so much for hosting me.